This lecture today, it is titled Quenching the Firebrand. It is a, seems to be a very strange and interesting title. It's actually the fourth in a series of four lectures um, based on the Mandukya Karika. The first one was called The Essence of All Vedanta. And then the second one was called The Ultimate Truth. The third one was um, last week. It was called No Mind. By the way, I'm feeling some of that No Mind. I came back at 12.30 uh, from San Diego last night. And uh, I finally went to sleep at 2 a.m. or 2.30 a.m., I think. Uh, and of course, we had to be up and about uh, by 5.30 in the morning. So I'm feeling a bit of the no mind now. <laughs> so all of what I say today, don't take it as the gospel truth or uh, non-duality. It just might be jet lag. <laughs> so the third one uh, was, was called no mind. And the first one, two, three are based on the first three chapters of the Mandukya Karika. The Mandukya Karika has four chapters. And the fourth one, which I'm going to talk about today, the name of the chapter is Alata Shanti Prakarana, the, the chapter on quenching the firebrand. And that's why uh, I have given this name, quenching the firebrand. Now, this chapter is a bit of a miscellany. There are different things in this chapter. I am principally going to be talking about three things here. The first one is no less then why does the universe exist? Um, that's the question. <coughs> the second one is a controversy. I'll get down to it. But uh, the whole of the Mandukya Karika, and especially the fourth chapter, there is a cloud of controversy surrounding it. And um, I would be failing if I did not touch upon it at least, uh, at least bring it up. So we'll talk about the, that controversy next. And then finally, a very glorious conclusion. Gaudapada brings the entire Mandukya Karika to a wonderful conclusion, talking about the glory of human nature, of our own nature. So these are the three things I'll talk about. Though the fourth chapter talks about many things, these are the three main themes I'll talk about this morning. First of all, <coughs> this question of Alata Shanti, quenching the firebrand. The first thing is this, this great question, why does this universe exist? Um, why is this question discussed at all? Because remember, uh, Gaurapada wants to establish an absolute non-duality. Brahman alone exists and nothing else. Existence, consciousness, place. So the apparent universe which we are experiencing right now, according to Gaurapada, according to Advaita, does not have any real existence. No substantial existence. So he has to prove that, that the universe actually does not exist. <laughs> That's what he wants to show. In order to show that, he will, he will take up all the other theories which have been put forth to explain why the universe exists. In Indian philosophy, you find a range of other uh, explanations about the origination of the universe. And what Gaudapada wants to establish is the non-origination of the universe. Uh, his, what he is most famously or infamously known for is Ajatavada. Ajatavada means the unborn nature of the universe. The Brahman alone exists and no universe was really created. Really is the operational word here, important key word here. Apparently, of course, the universe is there. Gaurapada does not deny that you see a universe. But is it real other than the, the ultimate reality, pure consciousness, which is yourself? That is the question. And Gaurapada, the approach he takes is, instead of directly trying to demonstrate that which you cannot, what he does is takes up all the available theories and cuts them down. Shows that there is no cogent explanation for the existence of this universe or for the origination of the universe. This question is not uh, esoteric or uh, archaic. It's actually quite modern. It's interesting that just recently I was reading this book, Why Does the World Exist? by Jim Holt, who lives here in New York. He's a science uh, journalist very good writer. He has written another book recently. Um, uh, it already hit the bestseller charts. The book is called When Einstein Wa Walked with Godel. Um, you know, in Princeton, there is an in uh, institute called the Institute of Advanced Studies, IAS, in, in Princeton University. 
And the, I heard the story how it was established that in, after the depression, there was this very rich businessman who made an endowment to Princeton to establish the best science institute ever. And uh, this gentleman was not very highly educated, but he wanted best people to come to this institute. And so he said, hired the best physicist. Who is the best physicist? And the director at that time, president said, best physicist? Well, Einstein. Well, hire him. Mm -hmm. Hire Einstein? Why should he come here? At that time, Princeton itself, Princeton itself was not so well known also. Why should Einstein come here? Anyhow, hire him. So he made an offer to Einstein who was in Germany. And lo and behold, at that time, Professor Einstein was trying to get out of Germany, escape from Hitler. So when he got this offer, he said, fine, but I need so much money that to settle, resettle in the United States. This much salary I must be given. And when they said to the donor that Einstein is willing to come actually, and this much, he wants this much salary, and the donor said, triple it into three, and ask him to come over. And he, that's how Einstein came here, in the, the Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies. And then next the donor asked, who is the greatest mathematician in the world? He said, Kurt Gödel, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Get him. And they actually got him. So, <laughs> and Einstein, the story goes, he was very, um, you know, very popular and, and, and a very amiable person. So he made friends with everybody, he'd walk around. And Gödel was just the opposite. He was suspicious of everybody, a cold and forbidding figure. The only friend he had was Einstein here. And that these two, the greatest geni geniuses of the 20th century, they would take walks on the lawn there, or you know, they would walk together. And so that's how the book is named, when Einstein walked with Gödel uh, here. But his earlier book, which is very interesting, why does the world exist? And I'll show you the relationship, what, what I'm going to speak about. This gentleman, he thought, Jim Holt, he thought that the greatest question is, why is there something rather than nothing? And so he goes around asking this question. What explanation is there for the origin of this universe? World by world, he means the entire universe, everything. What is the origin of this? And is it Big Bang? He goes to physicists and asks, can physics explain the origin of the universe? Is it uh, God? Is God the origin of the universe? He goes to the top theologians of the world, not only in New York, he goes to uh, Oxford University in different places in Europe and asks them, could God the concept of God explain the universe. He goes to mathematicians, um, famously Sir Roger Penrose, who is a mathematical physicist, um, and a very beautiful interview with him. Can you explain the uh, origin of the universe from mathematics? Uh, I remember that I had once heard Sir Roger Penrose uh, give a talk. You know, his very famous book, Emperor's New Mind. I, I had heard him give a talk in Calcutta. It was sponsored by the British Council. So Sir Roger came there and gave a talk. And I was, uh, what struck me was, first of all, this cutting edge physicist in the world today. The talk he gave was entirely on, no computers, no projectors or PowerPoint, entirely on this, you know, this transparency, the older people here will know him. OHP overhead projector. He was using that and he was drawing little, little squiggles. And his presentation was quite amazing, even from a Vedantic standpoint, because his point was, what puzzles him is, this amazing congruence between human consciousness, physics, and mathematics. Mathematics, he drew a triangle. Mathematics, physics, human consciousness. The universe, what he called the platonic world of numbers, and human consciousness. How are the three connected? Because obviously they are connected. We understand mathematics and do mathematics. We understand the universe through physics. And mathematics explains a lot of physics. Mathematics is used to make physics discoveries. And uh, the three seem to be connected, and yet they should not be connected. So that was his uh, theme. Anyhow, Jim Holt goes and asks all these people, ask these questions. And the result is he has put in a book. If you are eagerly listening, well, what is the answer? There's no final answer given. They don't look for the answer, but enjoy the journey when you read that book. Exactly the same question is taken up by Gaudapada 1400 years ago. How does the universe originate? What are the available theories? So like Jim Holt, Gaudapada goes around asking the different philosophers of the time, give me your theories. How does the universe originate? So he takes up Broadly speaking, I'm going to summarize a lot here, very quickly. 
this is basically the subject of causality. Cause of, not, not cause of one thing. The seed is the cause of the tree. Parents are the cause of children. Not just one thing. Cause of everything. What is the cause of everything in the universe? The universe itself. So that's that question, the, cause, the question of causality. And Gaudapada will go on to establish non-causality. There is no causality ultimately. That's what he wants to establish. Now he takes up the various theories of causality available in Indian philosophy at that time. So the first one he takes up, see basically he talks about a theory of the Nyaya Vaisheshikas, the logicians. Then he talks about the theory of the Sankhyas. Then he talks about the theory of, of karma, theory of karma. He talks about a theory offered by the Vish later by the Vishishtadvaitins. At that time, the Vishishtadvaitins had not originated that particular theory. But anyway, he talks about the Buddhistic approach to it. And finally, he talks about the Upanishads themselves. Because the Upanishads themselves offer many theories about the origin of the universe. And refutes all of them. Including, strangely enough, even the Upanishads. But he doesn't refute it. He explains it in a different way. So what does he say? Very quickly, I'm going to cruise through it very fast. I'm not going to go into the depths. They are very subtle issues and prolonged uh, debates are there. Between each school of ca causality, the debates have lasted for more than a thousand years, 1500 years or so. So I'm going to summarize that in five minutes. But very quickly. The Nyaya Vaisheshika school. Um, there are two schools actually, Nyaya and Vaisheshika, but they are known as sister philosophies because they don't have too many conflicts between themselves. They are realists. And their idea of um, causality is called Asat Karyavada. The technical term Asat Karyavada means non-pre-existence of the effect in the cause. What does that mean? Does the, when the cause gives rise to the effect, did the effect exist in any form in the cause earlier or is it entirely new? <coughs> Is it entirely new? Now these might sound peculiar. They are not. Because there are modern counterparts to all of these. Even today we are discussing this. The whole idea of emergence. A theory of emergence. That new properties do they emerge out of which were previously non-existing. So this is exactly what the Nayaikas are saying. That the universe as such did not exist earlier. But by a combination of fundamental particles. And they talk about fundamental particles. They talk about eternity of space and free-floating particles, which they call atoms. In fact, the Indian word, in all Indian languages, Anu, the uh, word used for atoms, comes from the Vaisheshika uh, philosopher Kanada. Um, so, the atomic theory, that what happens is, that fr from, a pre from a cause where the effect did not exist earlier, it arises. Now, Gaudapada immediately cuts it down. He says that if the, the effect did not exist in any form at all in the cause, there was no link with the cause, then anything can arise from anything. You see, uh, an apple, apple tree might as well come up from a mango seed because there is no link between the cause and the effect. The, there is, uh, um, uh, so, so, what is the link between cause and effect if the effect arises uh, come without any a previous existence in the cause. So that is the, uh, very briefly speaking, the problem with Asad Karyavada. That means the spontaneous emergence of the effect. Um, here the effect is the whole universe. Again, I'm just, when I was reading that, I'm just amazed to see exactly the same thing is being discussed, but in the modern language of quantum physics by Jim Holt, when he goes to meet uh, quantum physicists, they're talking about how the universe emerged. The standard idea we hear about is the Big Bang theory. But then the question arises. See, Jim Holt's question is that uh, where did it come from? What is the cause? So if you, for the Big Bang also you can ask what is the cause? So the answer given by quantum <coughs> mechanics now, again I'm speaking without knowing what I'm speaking about. Not just because of San Diego last night, but also I'm not a physicist. So physicists among you will know better what they're talking about. He give, offers a variety of explanations which he got from interviewing different physicists. 
He says, uh, at the quantum level, things get weird, he says. That um, particles pop in and out of existence <coughs> randomly. So it will look like out of nothing it has come. Out of nothing it has come. Uh, so did the universe come from nothing? Uh, so that's what the preliminary answer he gets from the physicists. And that seems to be like the Nyaya Vaisheshika theory. A non-existing effect arises from the cause. Entirely new. And Jim Holt comes to the same conclusion as Gaudapada, that that cannot be. That something did not exist earlier, how can non-existence give rise to existence? And when he asks this question, this is a direct echo of, in the Chandogya Upanishad, Asata Katham Sadjayeta. How can existence come out of non-existence? Existence comes out of previous existence. And as he probes further, the quantum uh, physicists tell him, actually you are right. That uh, quantum flux is not non-existence. It's not that the particles ca come out of nothing. There is a, actually the word, the, the, the phrase he uses, very interesting phrase. Nothingness is unstable. <laughs> Nothingness is unstable. That means it seems that the quantum vacuum is actually full of virtual particles and lots of ghostly hap happenings which give rise to actual particles in, in our, our universe. So it's not absolute nothing. Uh, so there is something going on and a lot going on there which can be described mathematically or at least statistically. That brings us to the second theory which is the Sankhya Yoga theory which is called Satkarya Vada. Universe emerges not from nothing but from a previously existing something. Uh, the effect ex pre-existed in the cause in a hidden form and it was manifested. So cause to effect is not a new creation but rather the manifestation of a previously hidden potential. Now this is a very sophisticated idea of causation. It tallies very well with mo modern understanding. So for example, uh, when a mango seed gives rise to a mango tree, the mango tree in its potential, now we know, it definitely existed in the DNA, in the seed itself. Uh, it couldn't have come out any other way. So the, the information is already coded into the cause and that is only expressed as the effect. Whether it is a mango tree or it's the entire universe, in some potential form it must have existed in the cause. And now, what is creation? It is just manifestation of an unmanifest effect. The, manif the effect was unmanifest, hidden in the cause, now it is manifested. So it is called Sat Karya Vada. The effect pre-existed in the cause in a hidden form, in a potential form. This Sat Karya Vada is a fundamental theory. It is the most popular theory of causation in Indian philosophy, accepted by Sankhya and Yoga and in some form by Vedanta, in a modified form by Vedanta also. Gaudapada will have nothing of it. He cuts it down immediately. He says, see, according to the Sankhya, Prakriti, composed of Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. I'm going very fast. I'm not going to explain anything here. Prakriti, composed of Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, is an unmanifest reality, but it is unstable. I mean, I'm, I'm always amazed at how his language parallels what Jim Holt is interviewing, Penrose and, and a number of other top physicists, exactly the same language. Of course, I'm not saying God about the new physics or new mathematics and all of that. But the principle, he's so amazingly, it's, it's exactly shadowing. He's, um, the, the Sankhyans say, Prakriti is unstable. Though it's unmanifest, it looks like nothing. It's unstable. It produces, it changes into the universe. Now the Sankhyans insist Prakriti the root nature is eternal and yet changing. And that's where Gaudapada catches. If it is eternal, it cannot be unchanging. It, it cannot be changing. It must be in some sense eternal and unchanging. If it changes into the universe, it cannot be eternal. It's gone now. So this crucial place uh, Gaudapada catches, the Sankhyans. How can an eternal, unchanging Prakriti give rise to a changing universe. How can it change, actually change into the, the universe? This is where Gaudapada catches and he lets go of that theory. Then comes another theory, the law of karma, which is uh, a favorite among all Indian philosophers, except Gaudapada. 
he doesn't like it. The law of karma states basically, law of karma is, is causality at its essence. All effects have causes and every cause will have a consequence and effect. So whatever we are experiencing in our own lives and in the physical universe, all have their effects in the past. And whatever we do now and whatever is happening now in the physical universe, all will have their effects in the future. Now Gaurapada asks this question, if this entire universe is a product of our karma, then where did this karma come from? So you see, the answer is usually past lives. And then where did those past lives come from? From the previous karma of the earlier lives. And where did those earlier lives come from? So lives before that. Immediately you'll ask the question, where did it all start? Where did the first karma start? There is an answer. The uh, people who, who propound the law of karma, they say, the first karma did not start. It is meaningless to speak about the first karma. It's a beginningless series. Gaurapada immediately catches. A beginningless series, anadi in Sanskrit, a beginningless series sounds suspiciously, suspiciously like an endless series also. Mm -hmm. That which is without beginning can, probably has no end. If it has no end, then moksha, liberation, the whole point of these Indian philosophies, moksha, nirvana, it's not possible. If you are caught in an unending chain of karma, cause and effect, effects become causes, causes become effects, then you will keep on going through karma and births and deaths. There is no escape then. And supposing, supposing you say, no, there is an escape. Karma comes to an end. Our cycle of births and deaths comes to an end. All the Indian philosophies want to say this, except the materialist, the Charvaka. Um, the Hindus and the Jains and the Buddhists, they all want to say liberation is possible, moksha is possible, nirvana is possible. Gaurapada, of course, is, an, uh, is immediately he catches there. He says, oh, then karma is real. Yes. And karma has an end. Yes. And that leads to moksha. Moksha begins after karma ends. Yes. That which begins also must come to an end. If moksha begins, then it, it has a beginning, it will probably have an end. The Buddha himself said, all compounded things fall apart. That which has a beginning will also have an end. If moksha has a beginning, if nirvana has a beginning, if freedom has a beginning, it will end in bondage. So it dispenses with the karma theory. Now, <laughs> he's going to ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> then comes the, um, what later became the Vishishta Dvaita theory. That it's not that something produced something else, it is one integral whole. Um, this universe was not actually produced by something, Brahman or Prakriti or something, but it is the body of God. Vishishta Dvaita says there is one divine unity in this universe. It's not one cause and effect. Within the universe there is cause and effect, but the entire universe was not produced by something else. The entire universe is eternal, the body of God. So this is all Brahman. Then Gaurapada asks, but within the universe you accept change? Causes become effects. Obviously there is change. If this is real, yeah. parents give birth to children, parents die, children grow up, then children die, and the grandchildren grow up. Um, the world rotates and seasons change. There is continuous change here. Yes, within the universe there is change. But this universe you said is a part of Brahman, the eternal reality? Yes. So Brahman is subject to change? No, a part is subject to change and uh, the rest is not subject to change. So Brahman is a composite uh, unity, like uh, a part of which is always changing and part unchanging. Uh, and then he gives the example uh, of a chicken. Um, you uh, eat the top half and expect the bottom to lay eggs also. <laughs> Gaurapada does not give that example. Shankaracharya gives that example. And so Gaurapada gives up this half-baked theory that uh, part of it can change and part of it cannot change and they are all part of the same thing. Then, uh, then you, are, you are actually admitting God can change and grow old and die, basically. That does not make sense to Gaurapada. Then it comes, uh, along comes the, the last one he takes up is the Buddhist approach. The Buddhist approach is not so much a theory of origination, that there is a world, their approach is Artha Kriya Karitvam which means practical efficiency, practical efficacy. You cannot dismiss the world. This is one school of Buddhism, actually. This is one school of Buddhism. Uh, you cannot dismiss the world because 
it works. You feel thirsty, you drink water, you're thirsty, satisfied. You get into a car and drive, you go from um, the Vedanta Society to um, the um, Empire State Building. It works. Everything works in the world. What you, what you see, because it has practical efficiency, it must work. Because if it was false, he says, Gaurapada, you claim that the world is an appearance. If it was false, like the water in a mirage, and I went to drink that water in a mirage, I, it wouldn't satisfy my thirst. So that I can say it's false because it does not work in, in reality. It has no practical value. But this universe has practical value. Uh, it, it, is called, it has got utility. That utility shows that it, ha it is real. Uh, that's the Buddhistic approach. It's not exactly a theory of origination. But Gaurapada immediately says that, uh, but in dreams, if you were to feel thirsty and you took up a glass of Water. What water? Dream water. You drank it. It would satisfy your thirst. What thirst? Dream thirst. But when you woke up, you would see that there was no, no such water and the thirst also was, was not real um, uh, in, in the waking state. In which case, though it worked, afterwards when you wake up, you deny the whole thing. You don't say that I drank water in my dream. I don't need any water now. No. So it could work in a dream, and yet it could still be a dream. Again, I see how contemporary these theories are. The whole of pragmatism, William James, Charles Pierce, it's a classic American philosophy, pragmatism, is based on utility and truth. So if it works, it's real. And it has its effects, in, it has its uses in the world of philosophy. But ultimately, the universe, because it works, because it can give you practical value and therefore it is real. No, that argument, Gaurapada doesn't buy into that. Then what is his argument? He says that um, this world is not real. It's an appearance of Brahman. Brahman did not give rise to a real world. That's his argument. What's it like? Example is the dream example. Where you see people and events happen, you go to places, time, space, people, objects, everything seen in a dream. When you wake up, what do you say? Oh, it was a dream. It was all in my mind. It was not really, I did, did not actually go to those places. I did not actually meet those people. I did not actually eat that food. It was all my mind. Though I experienced it all, but I know it's not real. Why? It was nothing apart from my mind. Similarly, Gaurapada says, very carefully here, many people think that Gaurapada said that the, this world is also a projection of the mind. He doesn't mean to say that. He says this world is imagined in consciousness just as your dreams are imagined in your mind. Dreams are projection of the mind, nobody denies. This world is experienced in consciousness and is nothing apart from consciousness. That is the conclusion of Gaurapada based on the dream example. Then he introduces a curious example, which is the reason for the name of the chapter. He says, take a firebrand. You know what a firebrand is? Like a, like a glowing piece of charcoal. And you swing it around in various shapes, you know, circles and patterns. And you will see glowing patterns in the, especially if at night, you get a wonderful display of patterns in, in, the, sky, in the sky. When you swing it around, circles and whatnot, and ellipses and... So, but those are not there. They are illusions because of that point of light. Exactly like that, he says, because of consciousness, we have the experience of a universe which actually does not exist in itself. When you realize this, he calls it Alata Shanti. Alata means firebrand. Alata Chakra, firebrand circle. So th that's the example he uses. And quenching the firebrand, if you put the firebrand in water, it hisses and goes out. So quenching the firebrand is you, you put this whole idea of the origination of the universe. It's like the whirling the firebrand. It's the circle of the firebrand. You put it in the cooling water of the knowledge of which Gaurapada is offering and it hisses and goes out. And you realize it was not there at all. So that's the example. And that's why the name has come. Alata Shanti um, pr uh, Prakarana quenching the firebrand, or the cessation of the whirling of the firebrand. 
Now that, that still leaves one question. That Gaurapada, oh Gaurapada, your own Upanishads, your Vedantic. So your own Upanishads, they talk about the origin of the universe. Taittiriya Upanishad says, Tasmad Tasmad Atmana Akasha Sambhuta. From this very Atman, from this very consciousness, space and air and fire and water and earth were produced and by the mixture of the five elements this universe was produced. The unit, your own Upanishads talk about the origination of the universe. So how do you explain that? You can't say they are wrong and Gaurapada has to toe a very careful line here. If he cuts those down, then he has cut down his own root. You know the famous story? I think it refers to Kalidas or somebody who, the great poet who was a dud before he became a great poet. He was sitting on a branch of a tree and, and, and then cutting the branch. You know, like he was sitting facing the tree and the branch is here, cutting the branch itself. <laughs> so he would fall down. Now he can't cut down the Upanishads because he is, uh, he is after all a Vedantin. So what he says is, that's a standard e e explanation that we have in Vedanta, is that the Upanishads give you a graded answer. Straight away, if you are told, there's no world, it's only Brahman, we are left high and dry. The world is all we know. And Brahman is something we don't understand. How are we to ever understand this kind of a theory? It seems too radical. Now if they introduce, here is the world, don't worry, here is the world. Okay, I'm happy. Now just think, that the world has a cause, it is called Brahman. It works that classic example of the clay pot. You have a pot. Really it is clay. If somebody, and if I, did, if I do not know what clay is, if somebody comes to me and says that you don't have a pot, there is no pot. I am holding a pot. What do you mean there is no pot? The way to convince me would be, you would say, look, here is your pot. Be happy with it. No problem. I am not taking it away from you. Oh good, let me clutch my pot. And then, now think. This pot has a cause. It originated from its cause. I see. What is the cause? I've got the pot. I'm safe. The pot is safe. What is the cause? The cause is clay. The material out of which the pot has come. So the cause is clay and the effect is pot. Okay, I get, get it. Oh, very nice. Where is the clay? Look at the pot. It's okay. The top is clay. The bottom is clay. Inside is clay. Outside is clay. What you are touching is clay. What you weigh is the clay. In fact, through and through it is clay alone. Okay, I see. Oh, so this is clay. Now think, if it is through and through clay alone, there is no such thing called the pot. You're not holding a pot, you're holding clay. Then what is a pot? It's a name. It's a particular form. It's a particular use. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara in Sanskrit. But it's not a thing. It's not a substance. It's not a reality in itself. If you argue, if I argue, no, all right, I get it. There is clay, but as you said, there is a form. So the form is also there, right? No, the form is not there in the sense that the clay is there. Because if you take the clay away, the form will not be there. Clay can exist without the form. But the form cannot exist without the clay. Just think about it. The form of a pot. Can it exist without the clay, constituent clay? No. Can the clay exist without the pot? Yes. If it was not, it was a lump of clay before it was a pot. If you break the pot, it will be pot shirts, broken uh, pieces of a pot. So it will not, the pot depends on the clay. The clay does not depend on the pot. The pot is not a reality in the sense the clay is a reality. Clay alone is real. Pot is an appearance of the clay. Pot real, pot satyam. No, clay satyam, pot mithya. And not that jiva is clay alone. Yet you are the clay alone. No, I'm not saying that. The clay alone is real. The pot is an appearance thereof. We come to that conclusion. If you come to that conclusion, it's all right. What Gaudapada is objecting to is, if you stop halfway. If you say, there is clay, the cause of the pot. There's something called a pot and something called clay and the clay has caused a pot. If you stop there, Gaudapada objects to it. You can never demonstrate two things causally linked. There's no real causation there. What you did was, you used the theory of causation. The pot is an effect, clay is a cause, investigate it. Using the cause-effect relationship, you will end up with clay alone. 
and then cause effect relationship is given up because the clay did not actually produce a pot. There's no effect called a pot. Are you following me? There's no real effect called a pot. So there's no real causation involved. But the theory of causation was used for what? For going from the pot paradigm to the clay paradigm. What is the use of going from the pot paradigm to the clay paradigm? The clay paradigm is real, is more real, is real compared to the pot paradigm. I'm having a good time, I hope. <laughs> huh. But if you stop halfway in between, there is something real called clay. Somebody wrote an email to me. It, unless you think it through, it will appear like that. You know, Swami, I used to think it was a pot, but now you say it's clay, I realize that. But it's, still, it seems to me there are two realities, clay and pot. Somebody wrote an email to me. There are not two realities. How can you prove it? Simple. I'll keep the clay, you keep your pot. <laughs> for pot and clay, it might not make so much a difference. If it's a golden uh, necklace, for example, I'll keep the gold, you keep the necklace. No, it will not work. There is no separate thing called a pot. If you stop there, clay and pot, clay is real, pot is also real. Then this is what Alan Watts calls, calls the crackpot theory. Crackpot theory, and exactly Gaudapada agrees with him. Or rather we should say Alan Watts agrees with Gaudapada because Gaudapada was 14 centuries before Alan. He, he says this does not stand. But the theory of causation can be used to investigate and come to the understanding that it is consciousness alone. All right. So these are the theories which he has taken up. I thought I would take five minutes to explain. I've taken 30 minutes. This is just the first opening theme. Two more things to go through. Very quickly then. The second one is the controversy I said which I, will, uh, which I would like to touch upon. The controversy is this. The Mandukya Karika, the four chapters, and especially the fourth chapter, this one. Some scholars in modern times have said it clearly shows a Buddhistic influence. Is it Hindu or is it Buddhist? Not only that, Professor S. N. Das Gupta, who was a great scholar of Indian philosophy in the 20th century, he, he goes so far as to say, clear influences of Buddhism are seen throughout the Mandukya Karika, and probably Gaurapada was a Buddhist. He goes on to say that. And um, there are others. Vidushekar Bhattacharya, who is a great uh, professor of, uh, of Buddhism in Shantiniketan, he also analyzes this and comes up with the conclusion that it is strongly Buddhistic. Why? Why do they say that? Um, I'll give many reasons. For the detailed discussion of this thing, one place I can refer you to is Swami Nikhilananda's translation of the Mandukya Karika. The, not, not the one published from here, but the one published from uh, Madras Mat in India. So that edition has a long and detailed introduction where this whole issue of Buddhistic origins of Mandukya Karika is taken up and point by point the, 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 the question is discussed. But let me just give you a taste of what's going on there. Why do they say such a thing? Why do they say it's Buddhistic? Well, in the fourth chapter, the first verse, Gaudapada starts off with, with these words. Some Buddham Vande Sambuddham Vande Dvipadam Varam. I salute Sambuddha, the Buddha, the awakened one, the most excellent among all human beings. <laughs> you start off by saluting Buddha. That's one. At the very end of the, it, it's a big chapter with 100 karikas, 100 verses. The 99th verse ends by almost the last verse, it sort of concludes, wraps up by saying, Naitad buddhena bhashitam. What I have taught here was not taught by the Buddha. You say, well, that's it, clear. Gaudapada himself is saying it was not taught by the Buddha. But wait a minute. Why did he say that? If it is not a Buddhistic teaching, why would he suddenly say it was not ta taught by XYZ? Suddenly. And throughout the hundred verses, Numerous Buddhist terms, clearly Buddhistic terms, jiva, the sentient being, called dharmaha, which is not usually a term used in Vedanta, it's a term used in, in Buddhism. 
So these terms are used and the arguments are also Buddhistic. Even the name of the chapter, Alata Shanti, is Buddhistic. And so for these reasons, you see there is numerous um, examples to show that Buddhistic influence. What are the answers to this? The opposing side? Um, well, the answers are, are numerous. For example, when you start off by saluting the Buddha, the word Buddha means the awakened one. And Shankaracharya explains there, some Buddha means the awakened one, the teacher of this philosophy, Dvipadam Varam, the most excellent among all beings. He refers to Narayana, he says. Shankaracharya says very clearly. The Hindu deity Narayana. At the very end, when um, Gaudapada says, Naitad Buddhena Bhashitam, this was not taught by the Buddha. Shankaracharya explains, why did he suddenly say this? Shankaracharya says, when the Buddha denies the reality of the external, when the Buddha teaches the unreality of the external world and the reality of consciousness alone, he has come very close to non-duality. But the non-duality taught here that you are the non-dual truth, you, this can be known from the Upanishads from Vedanta alone. Therefore, this was not taught by the Buddha. So that is Shankaracharya's, when he says, Bhayartha Nirakaranam, denial of external realities. Chaitanya Matra Kalpana, the conception of consciousness alone. Chaitanya Matra Kalpana Cha. Advaya Vastu Samipya Muktam. Simple Sanskrit. Samipyam in Sanskrit word means closeness. In, in Indian languages also, Samipyam, Samip in, in Hindi means near something, close. Close to what? Advaya Vastu, the non-dual non -dual reality. So the Buddha has taught something which is pretty close to what we are saying. And this is a very grudging ad admission from Shankaracharya. Because on numerous occasions, he refutes Buddhistic teachings. But on this occasion, he clearly says what the Buddha has taught is really very close to what we are saying. That's why Gaurapada makes the distinction. Naitad buddhe navashitam. This is not exactly the teaching of the Buddha. Um, where does it differ? Well, on, on many, many places. For example, Upanishad. Mandukya Upanishad. Upanishad clearly is a Vedic text. There is no question of the, any of the Buddhist schools taking up a Vedic text to te give their teachings. Not only that, as far as I'm aware, uh, I may be wrong, but as far as I'm aware, from all my studies of Buddhistic schools, I've never come across any Buddhistic school which claims the Mandukya as its text. It does, Buddhists, Buddhists never claim the Mandukya as the text. So, um, it does not seem that the Mandukya Upanishad was a Buddhistic text. What about the influence of Buddhism on the Mandukya? Clearly there is an influence. There's no doubt. You should not, one should not deny it. But this influence is not surprising. Because at the time Gaudapada was writing this, 1400 years ago, Buddhism was at its peak or just past its peak. Very popular, very widespread in India. And the terminology of Buddhism was scattered throughout discussions of Indian philosophy in those days, 1400 years ago. It is very natural that Gaudapada would use the current terminology to give his teachings. For example, the great Advaita teacher Madhusudan Saraswati, who lived some 400, 500, 500 years ago, contemporary of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he uses extensive Navya Nyaya terminology, the terminology of the neologic school in India. And indeed, all philosophers at that time, they used the Navya Nyaya terminology. Though they are, not mem they are not part of the Nyaya school, they are opposed to the Nyaya school. They may be non-dualists or Dvaita Vedanta or Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta, but they all use that terminology. Even to refute the school of Nyaya, they use Nyaya terminology. Why? Because it's a very convenient, very precise language for your philosophy. It was developed for philosophy. Exactly like that, uh, Gaudapada could have used um, and definitely has used Buddhistic terms and Buddhistic argumentation techniques and logic and presented his teachings. Anyway, one could go on. So, um, we'll put that aside and come to the conclusion. Concluding the fourth chapter, 
and the entire Mandukya Karika, Gaurapada brings it to a very glorious declaration of our nature, inner nature. Hark back to the core teaching of the Mandukya Upanishad, that our entire world of experience, this universe, and I the experiencer, the subject and the object, the knower, the known, and the knowledge that we have, and the dream experience, knower, known, and the knowledge that we have in dream, and the deep sleep sub subject, object, undifferentiated darkness of deep sleep, all three are appearing in what is called the fourth. The three are appearances and the fourth is the reality. Or we can say the fourth called the Turiya. The Turiya, another name for Brahman, Atman and so on. The Turiya, that pure consciousness in which all the experiences arise, that is the one reality. And the three are appearances. The Turiya is the reality. Brahman, Brahman is real. Brahma Satyam. <coughs> Jagat Mithya. The universe is an appearance. What is the universe? Waking universe. Dream universe. Deep sleep. Deep sleep universe is a, an oxymoron. But basically it's the waking and dream universes packed into an indistinguishable mass in the, dream, uh, in the deep sleep e experience. The three universes are appearances. And that one consciousness is real. You say, so, you are that one consciousness. The Upanishad says, Ayamatma Brahma. This very self is the ultimate reality. And that is, that conclusion, Gaurapada puts in such beautiful language at the end of the, uh, uh, he brings his masterpiece to a conclusion. He says, um, uh, he says, Prakritya Genya Akash Prakritya Akashavad Genyaha Prakritya Akashavad Genyaha Sarve Dharma Look at this word Dharmaha Sarve Dharmaha Anadayaha By their very nature all these sentient beings they are like the sky eternal like the sky What do you mean like the sky? We'll come to it They are like the sky Vidyate Nahi Nanatvam Tesham kvachana kinchana. There is no diversity here. There is no multiplicity here among all these sentient beings. Though they seem to be multiple. There never was, nowhere was any multiplicity. Now what a remarkable thing it said. It said you are like the sky. Sky in what sense? You are the, like the sky encompasses everything. Everything in the universe exists in space. Or physicists would say in space-time. Everything in the universe exists in space-time. In the same way, everything that you experience in life actually exists in you, the consciousness. The, that fourth Turiya, it is in that that the entire universe, waking, dreaming and deep sleep, is experienced. Those experiences, those things are in the Turiya. In, in the sense, they are appearances of that one Turiya. So you are like the sky encompassing the entire universe. We thought, I am this little creature... Uh, and I'm enclosed in a bag of skin. Be beyond that, I don't exist. My limit is this much. Up to the tip of my finger, I exist. No more. But Gaurapada says, you are the awareness. When this was being taught, one monk, uh, uh, he said, just a minute. He ta told the Swami who was teaching, just a minute. Very practical question. Just a minute. You say, I am all pervading. It sounds nice, but practically let me ask. I feel I am here. I am here and not even there. I don't even pervade this room. How can I pervade the entire universe? I am here and not there. That's what I feel. You are saying at this moment you are all pervasive. Look at the answer. The answer was, in Hindi he asked, Yaha, main to yaha hu, waha nahi hu. Here, not there. And he says, here and there, are they not both experienced in your own awareness? Yaha or waha, dono hi aapke chetan mein nahi hai kya? What does that mean? Very easy to understand. Suppose in terms of a dream, somebody tells you, oh, you are, this is a dream, it's not real. You're standing here in Central Park maybe. You are actually lying in your bed and dreaming all this up. You are all of this, you pervade all of this. And you'll say, no, I'm standing here by the lake. And this huge lake and the huge Central Park and Manhattan, I'm here, I'm not there. But when you wake up, what will happen? 
you will realize all of that. That little guy there and the lake and the park and Manhattan and the entire universe was in your mind. You said, okay, that's a dream, but what about this? This is exactly like that. Not a projection of your mind, but a projection in consciousness. All of this here and there, now and then, I and that, this me and this, subject and object, they are all appearances, arisings in consciousness. They shine in consciousness and disappear back into consciousness. That one consciousness, you are like the sky. A devotee, uh, of course, easier said than done. A devotee used to come to Sri Ramakrishna, who, would, who liked this, you know, he would say, I am the sky. And Sri Ramakrishna would say, yes, you are the sky. I am the sky. Ami Kho in Bengali, I am the sky. And then uh, the tax men were after him, the IRS, <laughs> in, the, in those days. He was worried about being, you know, he's, he sort of grumbled, I'll, I'll be ruined at these rates of taxation. And Sri Ramakrishna burst into laughter. But you are the sky, let the rascals come and take away your pots and pans. Goti vati nijak salara. Let the rascals come and take away your pots and pans. Sri Ramakrishna understood his struggle. Which points to two things. One is, this attitude, if one can hold on to it, it gives you a real serenity and peace. But it's also not easy. Especially around tax day, I think. It's not. <laughs> um, the sky is taintless, stainless. Think about it. All the pollution, oh, there's so much pollution and global warming, that's in the atmosphere. Space itself is not tainted by pollution. When there's fire burning, the air there heats up, the place heats up, but the sky doesn't heat up, the space doesn't heat up. If there is a, if there is a flood, that place is, um, it becomes drenched, but space does not become drenched. Space is not affected. Space is not created. Think about it this way. Gaurapada gives this example. Vast space is there. Now you take a pot and say that, okay, there is the space and there is the pot space. What is the pot space? The space enclosed by this pot. The moment I've made a pot, a pot space is born. Is it true? No, it's an illusion. It seems that there is a space enclosed by the pot. So why not? That space holds one liter of water, so there's an enclosed space. The space does not hold one liter of water. It's the pot which holds one liter of water. Think about it. The example is, suppose I have a glass of water here. If I move the glass, will the water move with it? What do you think? You're not sure? <laughs> Otherwise it will make a terrible wet mess if I move the glass and the water stays there. <laughs> the water moves with it because the water is actually enclosed by the glass. It's actually within the glass. It is held by the glass. But suppose there's an empty glass. Of course there is air there, but space, empty glass. When I move the glass, does the space within the glass move with the, with the glass? What do you think? No. Some people are thinking very hard. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not that the space within the glass moves with the glass. It's the glass which moves through space. When we are moving, the space enclosed in our bellies, in our chest, in, inside us, it's not that it's moving with us. Our organs are moving with us, with this body. But we are moving through space. Space is not affected by whatever is enclosed in space. Space is not born when you create a pot. Similarly, when a body is born, consciousness is not born with the body. The body appears in consciousness. We tend to get identified with it and say, I was born in such and such time, and, uh, and then this, or this person was born and this person dies. Birth and death are of the body. Only consciousness associated with the body, identifying with the body says, I am born, I shall die. Space is neither created nor destroyed. You, the consciousness, are like that. You, the, like space is not stained, you, the consciousness, are like that. You are not affected by either merit or demerit. No sin can touch you. As Vivekananda said, sinners, it is a sin to call ye so. You are the children of immortal bliss. He said in this country more than 100 years ago. He's talking about this. Consciousness is not affected by that. Yes, 
as long as you are in a body mind and think of yourself as as we all do as this limited individual this limited individual is subject to karma is subject to good deeds and bad deeds and sin and all of that and suffering and, and but you the consciousness from that standpoint from the turiya standpoint you are like the sky not affected by it gaurapada goes on to say again glorious language he says he's got remember he's talking about you आदि बुद्धा प्रकृत्या सर्वे धर्मा सुनिश्चिता ही सेज आदि बुद्धा प्रकृत्या बाय योर वेरी नेचर लुक एट द वर्ड ही यूजेस यू आर इटर्नली बुद्धास ईच ऑफ अस वी आर बुद्धा हाउ यू आर दिस कॉन्शियसनेस एवर ब्लेजिंग फोर्थ एवर रिवील शंकराचार्य सेज लाइक द सन continuously revealing itself and revealing everything else you are that con- consciousness continuously revealing yourself and revealing everything else you don't have to become brahman somebody thinks that oh by vedanta i'll have to you know somehow i will merge into brahman 50% merger 75% 80% 100% like corporate takeover brahman takeover uh not like that you are brahman always where adi what a beautiful term adi buddha the original buddha who is the original buddha you ever the buddha you know, i have to realize that right you have to you, even that one that that anxiety will have okay at that point i am the adi buddha fine but as long as i don't realize it because vedanta keeps telling me it's drilled into us you have to become enlightened you have to get what is enlightenment self knowledge brahma gyana Gorapada goes even see he's radical he says no 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 you are ever enlightened you are ever enlightened nothing has ever touched you this whole thing is your own game your own entertainment how are how am i ever enlightened that's too much rhetoric you're promising too much you are do you not you see what is enlightenment self knowledge aham brahmasmi i am brahman i am that consciousness are you aware of yourself i am no anybody who says i'm not aware of myself is a zombie <laughs> you are aware of yourself i am aware of we always have been aware of ourselves that i exist i am now the problem is yeah i know that i exist i am but this is not is this is not self knowledge this is not atma gyana why not because this i amness is surrounded by so much suffering it this is the source of all problem how is this any good to me i am old and i am diseased and i have mortgages and i have the irs after me and i have uh, and uh, uh, people don't li- i am not liked by people i am lonely so how is this i am doing me any good what gorapada said you are attaching the i am you are limiting it with so many adjuncts that those things you attach to that i am they are all appearances in your i amness they are there they change and they disappear they are not permanently connected to you who is permanently old nobody nobody is permanently young either that's the body i am in my consciousness all these things appear and change can you keep the pure i am consciousness let the others come and go don't hold on to them if they come welcome very good if they stay you are welcome to stay when they go goodbye nice seeing you whatever youth old age life death uh, plenty and prosperity and poverty success and failure welcome welcome to stay when they go goodbye nice meeting you they will come they will stay and they will disappear remember when they come they are not really there that's you when they stay and appear before you and try to scare you make faces at you they are not anything apart from you that's you you the consciousness i mean with that name and form and when they go nothing has really gone neither the good nor the bad nothing is really gone you are still there so this is what he says adi buddha shankaracharya explains ever shining forth like the sun all you have to do is just note it yes it is so and then then be happy 
like the song, happy song or something. Another term he uses, and one after another. This is these are 91st verse, 92nd verse, 93rd <coughs> verse, 93rd verse, um, 93rd, 94th verse, I think. 93rd verse he says, Adi Shanta Yanutpanna. Very beautiful. The unborn and originally, eternally at peace. Eternally serene, unborn. Oh, who's that? Sounds really cool. That's you. <laughs> eternally at peace and the unborn. You have never come into existence. You are existence itself. You are never born as a thing. The clay, though it appears like that, the clay never really becomes something new called a pot. At one phase, it looks like a pot, it is used like a pot and called a pot. It still remains, a cl remains clay. You still remain as pure consciousness eternally. Earlier you were, now you are, and later on also you will be. Limitless. See, even when we say eternal, earlier, now, later, we are acknowledging the presence of time. It's a tensed word. Tense not in the sense of tension and anxiety. Tensed in the sense of past tense, present tense and future tense. Because we have to use language, we have to use these words. But, um, but actually consciousness is not within time. Time is experienced by consciousness. In that sense consciousness, you transcend time. You transcend space. Where will I be pure consciousness? That where, here and there, that is also within your awareness. You experience space. Space doesn't experience you. Object, which one is pure consciousness? This one or that one or something else? All objects are experienced in pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is not an object. So these are all things which follow from saying that you are like the sky. Look at the words he used. Akashavadgeyaha, know yourself to be like the sky. Adi Buddhaha, you know yourself to be the original Buddha. Of course, the scholars will say, aha, Buddhist influence. Adi Buddha, you know yourself to the original Buddha. Adi Shantaha, know yourself to be serene without origin. Your serenity and calmness did not begin. It does not begin after Vedanta class. It does not begin after meditation. It does not begin after your psychotherapy session. Your serenity always is there. Right now it is there. In the midst of the greatest turmoil, in the midst of the greatest storm in your lives, that consciousness, unchanging consciousness, because it is there, you are able to experience that storm. Because it is there, you are able to experience all of this. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything comes because you are that serene consciousness. So this brings us to an end of a journey which we started a few months ago. The four talks on the four um, chapters of the Mandukya Karika. And I haven't even scratched the surface of the treasures that lie in that text. It's a very radical text of non-dualism. Um, after this, we'll have a short Q&A session. But first, let me do a peace chant. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, the Holy Mother, and Swami Vivekananda, that which we have studied in these four chapters, and which we shall keep on studying throughout our lives. Let it become a reality in our lives. It is a reality. Gaurapada would say, wait, it's a reality. <laughs> It's a reality, that is true. Let us notice and acknowledge that reality. We need the blessings of the Lord for that. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastam